Hello everyone, today we talk about the Duchy of Bavaria, in German the Herzogtum Bayern, that was a frontier region in the southeastern part of the Merovingian Empire uh, from essentially the beginning of the middle of the 6th century, at least when the Franks established um, an important control um, on, on the uh, area, uh, through the, uh, the 8th century as well, where as we will see it will be framed properly within Eastern French um, that would evolve in the kingdom of, of Germany. And it takes the name from the Bavarian tribes. Um, it was ruled, in fact, by a duke, uh, a dux. There were multiple duchas telling the truth. Um, and the Bavar ethnogenesis is, is quite interesting and a bit mysterious at the same time. Um, the, you know, Bavarian language um, is, has basically a lot in common with Alamannic, also with the extinguished uh, Longobardic, because it was an Elb, and it is an Elb German uh, language uh, that was product naturally of the migrations from the north. But in the case of the Bavarians, we're talking, especially from a political point of view, I mean, their duchy, and as it was compacted, as you know, from a series of clans, really, um, that would eventually compact in this stem duchies as we call them, kind of ethnic duchies that would make uh, a, a high medieval German for a long time uh, under, in fact, um, fr as, as a Frankish um, offspring of uh, some sort. Um, we're not terribly documented about those early times, but we understand that the Frankish overlordship um, translated itself in a, in a duke appointed by the Bermingians and or and of course the cooptation as it was for the other um, chunks let's say of the of the Merovingian Empire the ethnic ones uh, of the local uh, nobility and naturally the southeastern decentralized position was important for Bavaria that enjoyed for an important amount of time a considerable autonomy that as we will see was also a bit played um, between let's say the proximity of the Longobard kingdom uh, with which the Bavarians were deeply connected at some point, also in exactly to escape the Frankish orbit. Um, and the, uh, un um, until uh, the Carolingians fundamentally created an um, institution, at least uh, a, a new regime, a new, uh, a new duchy in itself, um, and um, it, um, it would, in part, with the collapse of the same Frankish empire, again in the late 9th century, acquire actually lion's share, right? Lions are, say, connected with Bavaria. If you look at the coat of arms, also think about Henry uh, the Lion de development. For most of the high Middle Ages, as you will see, in, in the late Middle Ages, Bavaria was powerful, but let's say, even territorially, and that, that's an important part to, to understand, as we'll see now, it had lost a, a, a very big part of, of what it had meant to be. I mean, historically speaking, it was a very extended area that encompassed also today's Ulster, for example. At some point, administratively, even northeastern Italy, um, and stretching in areas that um, are, um, you know, in fact, beyond the, uh, what we call, in fact, Bavaria today, including Tyrol, for example. The, uh, the current land uh, in Germany also encompasses some Franconian and Swabian territories that historically were not, in fact, part of uh, of Bavaria. In any case, it can be a bit confusing, we will try to, to see it better uh, in a while. And um, the Bavarians were also important during the Ottonian times, and they are a bit the unsung heroes of the clash against the Magyars, because the uh, they were, um, th there was essentially between the Carolingians and the Ottonians, there was the Leutpolding uh, dynasty that lasted also, you know, overlapping temporarily with the Ottonians. It was a bit of, uh, of a coming back. Um, but they fundamentally, as you know, were uh, ruled by a, a, a branch of the Ottonian dynasty that was also in competition with the the northern one in in saxony so it's a bit bavaria would play that also later on with the franconians in and the swabians in opposition always as as a as a land that had ambitions on 
on its own and played a bit the counter royal uh, policy and they fought importantly uh, against in fact the Magyars contributing definitely to weaken them uh, to soften them up before their defeat at the hands of Otto the I in 955 the definitive one um, and in at the end of the Etonian period however the Bavarian territory was essentially uh, forfeited uh, and uh, losing an important uh, amount of lands including the ones that would become the Duchy of Carinthia in fact in 976 so especially this eastern mark uh, that we will see uh, was created since Carolingian times to kind of counter the the hungers and during the 11th say between the end of the 11th and the end of the 12th century Holy Roman emperors met a strong opposition in Bavaria especially by the ducal house of wealth um, and they um, they were essentially in conflict with the Hohenstaufen dynasty uh, given the name in fact to the Guelphs so the Italian part eventually the European uh, faction let's say was fighting against uh, the German Empire uh, altogether and Duke Henry the Lion especially being uh, a prominent figure as you know in the German Middle Ages as an opponent and cousin of the same Frederick Barbarossa who would be finally banned and deprived of both um, his Bavarian and Saxon fiefs that he had accumulated by uh, by his same um, by his same cousin, same Barbarossa, and in, on that occasion, the emperor passed Bavaria over to the House of Wittelsbach, that uh, ruled over Bavaria, as you know, until the end of the Second German Empire, 1918. Um, and uh, historically, Bavaria during the modern age would also raised uh, to an, uh, an elector principality during the Thirty Years' War in 1623. They also were, as you know, in competition in part with the Habsburg in spite of the common ultra-Catholic um, identity. It was even a, um, a Holy Roman Emperor that was um, uh, elected later on in the modern age, uh, even after the, the Habsburgs had de facto monopolized the title. So I was saying before the geographic dimension here is important even to read some map. Um, so what what we consider as the medieval Bavarian ethnic duchy covered essentially present-day south southeastern Germany, most parts of Austria along the Danube River, uh, up to the Hungarian border, which ran along the Leitha tributary in the east. Um, of the Danube. It included the lands, in fact, that are considered as Alt Bayern, um, uh, that are encompassed by the modern state of Bavaria, uh, plus the lands of the Northgau March, uh, that would later become the Upper Palatinate, were essentially incorporated by, um, by Bavaria historically in the late Middle Ages. And um, as we were saying before, essentially the modern land um, uh, does include Swabian and Franconian territories uh, that historically were not part of the land. I mean, if, if you think about Nuremberg, here inserted some pictures of it, or the same Rothenburg of the Tauba that I have inserted instead. Um, as we were saying before, also uh, large East Alpine territories were lost uh, to to the creation of the Duchy of Carinthia in 976, that would cover the present-day Austrian states of Carinthian Styria, right? So, in the uh, properly from the, the the southeastern side of the Alpine watershed, were um, in fact kind of border regions, also ethnically speaking. I mean, the Ostsiedlung wrote even in there to the Germanization, but um, at that point, um, Bavaria had controlled some parts of, of the adjacent Carniolan region in today's Slovenia that also in fact remained Slavic essentially and the eastern mark of Austria that corresponds uh, to the present state of lower Austria so basically the historical Austria that as you know encompasses Styria, Carinthia and Tyrol that are 
not Austrians, identically speaking, they're just themselves, um, was also elevated to a duchy in its own right uh, in the mid-12th century, which brought to effectively a separation from, from, Austria, uh, from Bavaria at the time. Um, and uh, there were important ecclesiastical principalities that had traditionally uh, you know, been part of Bavaria, uh, in particular the Archbishopric of Salzburg, um, at the uh, opening of the Alpine Valleys that, as you know, b b gained uh, imperial immediacy, that is to say it, was a, uh, it had a direct connection with the emperor, like the, the free city-states, etc., so no other lord could uh, rule over it. But it, it was also a very strategical point, as you understand. The same was true for secular powers like the county of Tyrol, as well, um, that um, were uh, lost by the Wittelsbachs to the Habsburgs. Um, and there were also other interesting additions before in the High Middle Ages, for example, the, uh, the, the Bishopric of Trent, that was historically, you know, part of the Italic kingdom was attached to the kingdom of Germany and essentially to, to Bavaria as, uh, as uh, the internal district. Um, and such other changes we will in part see uh, today. Naturally, the capacity of controlling the entire Bavaria was very difficult and um, it never was attained practically um, because it was extremely extended, uh, as you understand, and also in the mountains everything was very complicated to, to control. It was not um, a, a very solid center. Even in Wittesbach's time that was the greatest problem, the fragmentation in various um, sub uh, lineages that uh, also as it happened for Austria telling you the truth with the Augsburgs in the late Middle Ages before they were reunited in a single line and this contributed to the uh, to, to the decline of the land compared to, to early medieval times and starting from the beginning um, the first evidence that we have of the older Bavarian duchy is around the mid 6th century and in his Jetica the chronicler Jordanus writes that area of the Swabians has the Bavari in the east the Franks in the west right so approximately and so we know that this had already happened um, we will make a video for the migration era peoples in which I will explain the, the ethnogenesis of the Bavarians, but essentially they were a mix of different peoples, as always. These Alp Germans originated from the uh, Bohemian forest area, fundamentally, and uh, actually Celtic populations, because south, um, I mean, um, on the right bank of the Danube, that, that was a, um, a Celtic, uh, Celto-Roman speaking here, in fact, Roman elements, and also Slavic ones, given that from the northeast the, the Slavs were beginning to, to, to settle, to colonize the outskirts also on the Danube and, and south of it, as you know. Um, at the time of the older duchy, uh, the ruling dynasty was essentially the Agilal thing one. Uh, and the Bavarians colonized the area from the march of the Nordgau along the Nab River, later the, the upper Palatinate, as we will see, up to the Enns in the east um, and southwards across the Brenner Pass, uh, up, to, to up the upper Adige a Valley in present-day South Tyrol. Um, the first documented duke of the Agile Finns was Garibald I, uh, that uh, had probably, in fact, some Frankish uh, origin and ruled from 555 onward as a largely independent Merovingian vassal. This was important for Bavaria because, as you know, the Merovingians were the only of the Germans that passed straight from paganism to Catholicism without Arianism. So Bavaria, as well as a Merovingian and Germanized area, was Catholic, albeit the Christianization of Bavaria, as even the one of the west neighboring Swabia was very superficial. It was not before, in fact, the 8th century that even the dukes converted to Christianity. This is important, if anything, for archaeology instead, because, you know, mm, people kept burying their dead with some important possessions, I don't know, weapons, something, especially the Alamannic world is more famous for this, but Bavaria had something similar. Uh, in spite of this, 
being within the Catholic network was was important as we will see also in the international relations, especially of course with through the papacy with the Longbert Kingdom that would play an important uh, part in the existence of early medieval early medieval Bavaria. On the eastern border, uh, changes occurred with the departure of the Longbirds from the Pannonian Basin to northern Italy, in fact, in 568. Um, and as you know, the land was settled by the Avars uh, and also some Slavs um, on the uh, more in the north instead that however had already permeated in part Pannonia eventually to be uh, even some areas that the Longbirds ruled at the time already and that probably in fact followed even to Italy um, and the hours were definitely not an easy neighbor and in fact it's from these times that you know the, the character of, of, of what would become the mark right and Austria, Syria and Carinthia would would be created as mostly the um, the the actual things actually ruled from Regensburg, from Castra Regina on the Danube River, m much further uh, upstream uh, of the Danube. Um, so, you know, kind of more distant from the direct our threat. But there were, as you know, several other invasions of Merovingian Germany at the same time. So this, this idea that the eastern frontier was kind of a hot one and therefore would bring to an important degree of militarization was was relevant also because the Merovingians, as far as they at least had a uh, capacity of, of uh, levying troops from Bavaria, would appreciate the local troops because they were kind of a bit more, you know, a bit weighted to this uh, state of um, frontier warfare um, in a way, and they they were kind of less gentrified than instead the, the Gallo-Roman populations of which the, the Franks mostly ruled from in, in their their homeland. Um, and at around 743 the Bavarian Duke Odilo managed to extend an important control over the Slavic princes of Carantania so roughly corresponding with the later March of Carinthia in fact at probably the softening also of the other power that in fact would be taken out uh, a few generations later by the St. Carolingians through, through, through Bavaria that was rearranged uh, also uh, probably as a, as a more markedly, uh, first of all, compact political entity, but probably also kind of a more frontier militarized one. And, uh, and in fact, the same Slavs that passed under Bavarian rule had accepted this condition to escape uh, the other uh, the other control and eventually now they could afford to do it as compared to before when the others were much more of a, of a dramatic power and during Christianization Bishop Corbinian laid the foundations for the later diocese of Freising before 724, I uh, considered that St. Kilian in the 7th century had been a missionary of the Franconian territory just in the north uh, west of Bavaria that um, then was ruled by the Dukes of Thuringia that had also been fundamentally encompassed by the Merovingian um, uh, Empire where Boniface uh, himself founded the diocese of Würzburg in 742. Also in the adjacent Alamannic, that would become known as Swabian lands, west of the Lech river that constituted in fact the, 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 the boundary between the two areas, Augsburg had become a bishop's seat. So when Boniface established the diocese of Passau, that is in today's, uh, as you know, at the very b in Germany, but at the very border w with Austria along the Danube, 739. Um, he could already build on local early Christian traditions, and uh, the the land had already entered, as we've seen, that orbit uh, early on. Also in the south, Saint uh, Rupert 
had founded in 696 the diocese of Salzburg, uh, probably after he had baptized the Duke Theodore of Bavaria himself at his court in Regensburg. And St. Ruprecht would in fact become known as the Apostle of Bavaria for that reason. Now you understand here how the most important cities that were present there, uh, mostly these ones of, of Roman foundation like Regensburg, Augsburg, um, etc. But also, you know, Salzburg as a crucial, uh, in fact, uh, market for the export. In fact, of salt that ar arrived up to Constantinople through through the Danube, uh, were the cornerstone of the the same Bavarian Dutch of a secular government that was being strengthened, in fact, by the establishment of a of an ecclesiastical administration. So much that, in fact, in 798, when things had changed a bit, as we will see now. However, Pope Leo the Third, the same one who would crown Charlemagne as emperor, created the Bavarian ecclesiastical province, making Salzburg the metropolitic seat, so the center, uh, and the suffragan dioceses in Regensburg, Passau, Freising, and Seben. Seben would be the later Brixen. And the delight motive, as we were hinting at before, of Bavarian foreign policy in early medieval times was this kind of, you know, autonomization from, from Frankish power. And as you know, the Merovingians had quite a rough time. It took time before the Carolingians could, you know, re-put things back together. Uh, in spite of, of course, the elites were always kind of connected, right? For the elites, distances are always very, very close. But um, in, in Germany, that had been gradually, but successfully, as you know, colonized by the Merovingians that had pushed further, also, in fact, the, the Roman boundaries, and later with the Carolingians would com complete with the annexation of Germany with the conquest of Saxon and its Christianization, um, w had always, um, you know, kind of intended, in fact, the, the eastern frontier, some, some sort of area to, to stabilize. We have seen it in recent videos, probably in stressing that the main strategic needs of, of the Franks was the securing of the eastern frontier, also to defend the Rhineland in the first place that was uh, growing uh, in importance. And um, the autonomy of the Bavarian dukes, dukes came to an end, in fact, in, in Carolingian times. Um, in up to that point, the Bavarians had sided mostly with the Longobards. The Longobards were the other big power in the south. And the Franks had been traditionally more powerful than them, but at the end of the 7th century, essentially, you know, the, the Merovingians were just four sub-kingdoms, while the, the Italic kingdom of the Longobards was prospering in a unitary way. And this strength of the powers is, is to be appreciated, for example, as I often recall, in, in the Alpine watersheds. I mean, in the 6th, 7th century, the Franks had tried with the Byzantines to take out the Longobards, right? And historically, the, the, the boundary, in fact, between Francia and Italy had remained shifted towards the, uh, uh, the, the Italian side. Right, and still today, France and Italy have this. Normally, countries that border uh, across, you know, you know, a, a, a mountain ridge have the watershed as their border. Is that, given that France was stronger than Italy, the um, the the boundaries from the Italian side, right, at the opening of the of the uh, of the valleys on, on the Po Valley, uh, equally was like that uh, between the Longobards and the Bavarians, because the Longobards had lands that were far past the watershed right in in the Danubian Valley right so crossing from the other side of the Alps but the Bavarians were kind of fine with that yes there were wars actually between the Longobards and the Bavarians but basically you know it wasn't much at that point the Bavarians would do and as we've seen they they had it better having an alliance with the Longobards in anti-Frankish function given that that was really the big center of power had it been reunited Famously enough, the um, the the Agilulf things provided also with a Longobard king, uh, Agilulf, in fact, uh, that is known as the Thuringian. In fact, there were mixed 
the origins there was lineages that had existed but like in a feudal sense there were signs of different houses that had participated to the longobard migrations as you know there were saxon thuringians swabians among uh, the longobards when they settled uh, in the pop valley and famously enough agilf is connected to bavaria because he married theodolinda who was actually the former widow queen of the longobards she had married Alteric within a dramatic passage in Paul de Diacon's Historia Longobardorum when he makes, uh, you know, his journey in incognito in in Bavaria to to meet the future the future wife, uh, which is fantastic. But there are also some military passages that are quite powerful there, um, on a military and religious point of view. And um, and Theodolinda was Bavarian; she was Catholic. She was beautiful, apparently, and, and, and she was she uh, that Longobard nobility that, as you know, elected uh, their own kings, let her ch- chose her husband in Agilulf, and Teodolinda is very famous because being Catholic promoted for the uh, transition of the Longobards from Arianism to Catholicism, and there are beautiful uh, letters. In fact, she exchanged it with Pope Gregory the Great, that at that point was trying to make things work out between the Papas and the Longobards, even in kind of an anti-Byzantine fashion. So there is this, um, and and remarkably enough, she convinced, in fact, Agilulf to have their son baptized according to the Catholic and not the Arian rite. Um, and so. This was mostly the the connection that had occurred that was that remained up to the eighth century um, when the Carolingians began to in fact make the, the Frankish Empire gain steam again. They had by that time incorporated the Franconian lands in the north of Bavaria um, and uh, so controlling also the, the the ecclesiastical administration there of Wurzburg as we've seen same time. Um, in the West also, there, there was this dramatic event that is the blood court at Cannstatt in se- 746 where the Alamannic nobility had basically invited over by, by the Franks and they, ha- they were literally exterminated uh, by treachery and put in an end essentially to the, the instances of revolt of the Alamannic nobility that had tried to resist, right, uh, as a, they were actually Frankish Alamannic elite at that point, but they hoped like on the Swabian base to put up a resistance. So those were definitely not good news for the Bavarians. It would have been simply next along the Danube Valley. And in fact, Bavaria was the last ethnic duchy to be incorporated, uh, say reincorporated politically, firm control under the Carolingian rule. This happened in 788 after actually a revolt also in Bavaria where Duke Tassilo III, that also was the the son-in-law of the last Longobard king Desiderius, that would be, you know, in fact, conquered by by Charlemagne, um, had um, led this kind of, you know, he d- he didn't really want to be under Carolingian rule. So at, at the end of the day, he was captured by Charlemagne, who uh, sentenced him to death, but eventually for- forgave him, and so as many political opponents at the time, uh, the poor Tassilo was uh, segregated in, in a monastery up to his death. Um, and this had occurred by the time uh, the, the Longobard kingdom had already been conquered by the Franks, and so uh, the Bavarians had lost the, the major international support. Tassilo was Charlemagne's cousin, by the way, so that makes you understand in any case how deeply intertwined these lineages were. So from 788 onwards, Bavaria was administered by Frankish officials, first of whom was Gerald, who governed the land uh, for 11 years. And by establishing direct rule over Bavaria, the Carolingians provoked the neighboring Avars that began to freak out uh, of the massive uh, Carolingian power that was being displayed essentially on their doorstep and so they passed on the offensive um, by raiding uh, the the Bavarian frontier uh, of the river Enns as we've seen uh, historically and 
uh, the, the Avars were not a new, in fact, to incursions in the Bavarian land, but now it was a matter of messing up with the Carolingians, which definitely were not letting things go that easily. Um, a Frankish Bavarian contingent managed to repel the Avars uh, as early as uh, 788 and launching a counterattack towards the same Avar heartland that were located along the river Danube uh, east of the Enns. And uh, we don't know exactly where the Avar uh, where the other center was was around Vienna likely um, however it was the the old kind of ring right of the steps peoples now at this point they had probably kind of more gentrified and enterized but it was overloaded in wealth of all the raids they carried out historically traditionally and so has the Hans had done I mean think about the Nibelungen the, the even same places, same patterns, well, the same Magyars will do as those lands, as we will see, were conquered by the Carolingians but lost to the Hungars that uh, had a bit of the same nomadic lifestyle, definitely. And there was a clash near the river Ibs, the Ibsfeld, um, in the same 788, where the Avars suffered a significant defeat at the hands of the Franks uh, and, and, and the Bavars. At this point Charlemagne thought well to consolidate the eastern frontier uh, so much that he came to Bavaria in person. The same 788. Charlemagne, as you know, spent his entire life making back and forth across Europe forever to organize relentlessly all these uh, important political and military administration. And in the center of, du of Bavarian ducal power, that is Regensburg, of course, he held a council and regulated issues regarding properly the marches, right, the frontier counties um, that were to pave the road for the major offensive would have been launched against the uh, our earthland to, to get rid of the problem for good. And this was an opportunity for the Bavarian nobility, also for lesser ones that um, Charlemagne intended to promote in order to counter also the most powerful one because the, the Marches life was risky but remunerative because those um, counts knew that the, the frontier would have been expanded and would have benefited and from it. Uh, there was an opportunity for a new establishment to be created there um, at mutual benefit. Um, in 709 it was a negotiation between the Avars and the Franks but no agreement was reached and Bavaria uh, then became the base for the massive Carolingian expedition against the Avars in 791. This is one of the uh, many, the, the second most formidable logistical masterpiece of the Carolingian army that really tells you how many resources they, they, they really had and how, what a hell of a of an organizer Charlemagne himself was and it um, basically consisted in two columns advancing on the banks of the river Danube with a with a massive fleet for the supplies etc and basically there was no uh, final clash, right, you know, the, the Avars didn't uh, co meet the, the Franks in a pitch battle, they just basically let them advance, and that tells you how, you know, crippled they already were, how um, decadent they have, have been, and the Carolingian army reached the region of the um, Vienna Woods, at the very ga gates of the Pannonian Plain, and the Franks simply acquired the area, right? Especially those between the river Enns and the Vienna woods that uh, represented kind of a buffer area. Also, in fact, consolidating the stability of Bavaria because this is what essentially the, the Franks were concerned about. We were, as we were saying before, like Saxony was conquered to finally free the Rhineland from hundreds of years uh, of raids the same consolidation of Thuringia up to the Elbe, right, you know, here the, the Franks are mostly uh, concentrated on this effort, at least in terms of cost-benefits, that's 
definitely where they invested the most because they, they had a, a broader vision of what areas needed to be stabilized in Central Europe, close to their heartland. And there was a major international cooperation also with the lands that had, uh, the other lands that had been conquered, the sand contingents and so on. And initially this kind of March area was brought under the jurisdiction of Gerald, uh, the Bavarian prefect. Uh, who uh, died in 799 and eventually uh, it, it became properly a frontier unit known as the Marca Orientalis, so the Eastern Mark which secured the communications between Bavaria and Pannonia and also kind of stabilized the Bavarian Eastern borders Consider that this time, after the hours were knocked out, there was literally nobody in the Carpathian Basin as a major power. So this is the moment in which the Carolingians and the Bavarians were involved in this, um, reached literally the, the the Bulgarian Empire, because it was the one that alternatively there was a lot of back and forth here, enormous uh, diplomatic activity effort also to win the Bulgarians who were still to officially convert the Byzantines uh, also like looked at the Danube and freaking out also in Italy that had been conquered that the, the Franks were everywhere now so it was a, um, a very important mess but let's say it was an enormous area of front it's important to stress the frontier especially in the southeast of Germany probably even more than in, in the north um, this area between the would become but the Magyars were not there right this is important even though it would become the, the area between the Germans the Slavs and the Hungarians, but and it would remain essentially a frontier one for so much time. We've seen this all, you know, up to the siege of Vienna in 1683. Uh, the entire also made. I'm proud to have made a master thesis about on the Battle of <laughs> Dürnkrut and Jedenspeig in 1278. It's basically the same places, same areas that kind of even even strategically were 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 almost like the same thing, the same places, the same. Uh, areas that in fact went largely depopulated. I mean if you visit them today in practice uh, there are vast areas that probably didn't could have could have grown more but were just normally a theater of important military operations raids etc contributed to, to remain the lands to remain a, a frontier. Beautiful places also naturalistically speaking. Now the um, you know what happened to the Carolingian Empire in practice uh, during the ninth century um, from the from eight eight hundred twenty five Louis the German that was that was were successors Charlemagne Louis the Pius and his sons uh, styled himself King of Bavaria as he was effectively ruling for what would become Eastern Francia in a while. Um, Pointing at was at the time probably the, the most advanced area um, in Germany, at least aside from Franconia, it was more kind of better organized and kind of more, um, you know, more Frankish in fact in nature. But this newly acquired area, also with its military character, its proximity to Italy, as we will see for the Carolingian successors, would be another strategic need to compete with. Uh, Charles the Bold on, on, on that occasion was called like this because in the broader partitions of the empire he had chosen in fact this eastern part and historiographically at least is known like that and that's how eastern Francia began right at this point the center was this uh, owned by Lothar the first who in fact controlled some some of the most important lands in central Europe and the kingdom of Italy but that entity would effectively separate whereas eastern Francia in spite also of its chronic political fragmentation kind of would go on as an entire thing institutionally and be the protagonist of the Renovatio Imperial but from Saxony and Franconia with Bavaria kind of being in fact not particularly happy with this and the um, uh, the successor of Louis the German was Carloman in 876 and Carloman's natural son Ar Arnulf of Carinthia rose to power uh, essentially after the death of uh, the last uh, 
true Carolingian, the Charles the Third. Um, also, after having clashed uh, for, in fact, the, the control of Italy, at some point, um, the 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 Eastern Frankish army had descended in Italy, as the Western Frankish had to determine at the extinction essentially of the Lotharingian line in the same Italy would have to, to rule and uh, amass probably the, possibly even a larger battle than Fontenoy or maybe just a second to it would have been fought there but it didn't happen because they agreed that Charles would have the imperial title namely the, the control of Italy but in practice this was just he would come back those possessions were already amassed by the way by that point it also so the the Eastern Franks would get something, uh, you know, as a greater stability uh, in the region. And Ar Arnulf of Carinthia was raised in the former Carantanian lands, so even there you understand properly the, 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 the military nature of, of uh, the Eastern Frankish ruling dynasty, also on the Elba had always been very active, as uh, the Ottonians would be later at the same time. And um, he um, ruled, in fact, from Carinthia and Bavaria as, as a base of its power, and with Regensburg as the seat of his government. So in spite of the control on far, uh, farther northern German lands, that, that was really the most important area, uh, the southeast, this crucial strategically speaking. And um, we in, in his agreement with Charles in, in 187, Arnulf also secured his election as German king the following year. And in 899, however, Bavaria passed to Louis the Child, um, that died very young, who was 16, 17, uh, the name came from, uh, in a pretty dark time for the land because that's when the Magyars had arrived and began to ravage Germany in the process. And uh, as other, mm, at this point, post-Carolingian lands, because th that Louis the Child was effectively, the, as we've seen, Arnulf was, was Ill an illegitimate, but uh, okay, for the Carolingians it was not that much of a big deal, so Charles the Bald was, but Louis was effectively the, the last, and he died that young. And, and so the entire thing collapsed, kind of. Uh, the political fragmentation in all the post-Carolingian kingdoms was, was kind of evident. And a major blow occurred especially for the Eastern Frankish and especially the, the Bavarian uh, ruling class when the Magyars defeated essentially the whole Bavarian army at the Battle of Pressburg. It was a major clash on July the 5th, 907 that essentially crippled the Eastern Frankish capacity to react the, the Magyar invasions for, for a long time to come. It was li literally a bloodbath of Bavarian noblemen. Uh, with the extinction of the uh, of, of the Carolingians, the Arnulfingians, whatever you want to call them, the ungrateful task of ruling the land passed to the descendants of Luitpold, that during the reign of Louis the Child had been Count of Shire. Uh, possessed large Bavarian domains and ruled, in fact, the Mark of Carinthia. So, um, this uh, district created on the southeastern frontier for the defense of Bavaria. Here, the military connection for political power is, is kind of evident, right? It was evident at large at the time, but in these lands, even more because they were constantly under attack. And so, political cohesion revolved around these effective leaders. Also, later, the Ottonians would become, put an end to the Magyar threat. Now, Luitpold had died himself in the great battle of Pressburg, and it would be his son Arnulf, surnamed the Bad, so just passing down to history with that name, or maybe Schwerpunkt will, um, rallied the remnants of the Bavarian clans and uh, managed with the, also negotiating with the Hungarians to r establish himself as Duke of the Bavarians in 911. He managed to rule loosely Bavarian Carinthia, giving uh, uh, birth to the Leutpolding 
dynasty of, of Bavaria that effectively would, would exist between the, the Carolingians and, and the Ottonians. And the Eastern Frankish king Conrad I tried to attack Arnulf when the latter refused to acknowledge his royal supremacy, uh, supremacy but he, he failed. Right? So this shows also what this kind of mm, ethnic uh, ducal kind of autonomy represented for even uh, royal power in Eastern Francia, right? It was about creating uh, a power base for, for themselves in, in a, such a dramatically unstable situation that they wouldn't even trust their next door neighbor or the same the same Eastern Franks. Uh, some, something of which the same Magyars benefited from, uh, in fact. And the, um, the, the self-confidence of the Bavarian dukes was, in fact, a big deal for the Eastern Frankish kings. Um, the same Arnulf's son, Eberhard, was deposed by Otto I of Germany in 938. And he was succeeded by his younger brother, Bertolt. However, in 948, Otto, the time still king, not emperor, finally disempowered the Lutopolding line and installed his younger brother, Henry, as Bavarian duke, thus giving birth to the Ottonian branch uh, of, of Bavaria, um, which also naturally reveals how important for, for the Ottonians who were becoming the major force in Germany with their Saxon and Franconian uh, power base Bavaria was, right, for also for the Magyar question, of course. Um, the Leutboldings were powerful enough, however, for uh, the late Duke Bertolt's minor heir, Henry III, to be recompensated by Otto with the office of Count Palatin. Um, that was essentially uh, some land was carved within the duchy for him. Um, and there was even a revolt organized by the Leutpoldings uh, at the detriment of the uh, of, of the Ottonians uh, that was actually triggered by the same Otto's son, the Duke Ludolf of Swabia. Uh, a, a revolt that was crushed, however, in 954. That was an important... I made a video about um, early medieval Alamannia and Rezia that takes in consideration that episode because that was exactly the moment in which the Ottonians were kind of pressing hard, kind of a more con um, kind of centralizing policy, right, to literally ap appoint the, um, the dukes of the various uh, ethnic uh, lands in Germany directly, right, in the same, within the same Ottonian family, it would, would be somebody who rebelled, backed naturally by the local nobility, and surely the the southern Germans, such as the Swabians and the Bavarians, didn't like uh, the northern ones very much, this is kind of a divide, consider that Germany at that point was just barely acquiring kind of a, what you would call a national identity, it was essentially something starting, you know, as a... Um, classical revival, ethnographically speaking, in, in the monastic sources of the 9th century in Eastern France, right, that, that now was, you know, with great effort being kind of engineered further by the Ottonians to give kind of a greater uh, solidity to, properly to the kingdom in itself, but as you know, Germany would never be unified, in fact, up to the 19th century, in spite of the best effort of the high medieval kings. And um, the land was still wild, primitive, covered in forests, swamps, major divides, literally geographic, couldn't be passed. That's also how these um, kind of ethnic differences were still present, because they were literally different countries separated by important obstacles and kind of having different orientations, interests, etc. In 952, Henry... Uh, Otto, Otto's younger brother, received the Italian mark of Verona, and this in fact is a yet another important aspect of the story, uh, as Otto I had just seized uh, 
the land from King Berengar II in his Italian expedition that uh, would lead eventually to the imperial crown, uh, etc. And this was happening still uh, during the Magyar threat that the Bavarians, as we were saying before, had actually contributed to stem to significantly cripple over time. So uh, while the Hungarians were stopped finally um, in Germany at the Battle of, of Lechfeld in 955, after which basically they didn't try it anymore. They kind of settled down, kind of being impressed actually by Germanic power and kind of buying the, the Western and also Roman Catholic model. Uh, the the Bavarians had really, you know, been the 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 anvil against which most of the Magyar hammers had struck, right, and resisting. Uh, importantly, but again, since the Ottonian propaganda was was massive and kind of self-centered, the Bavarian branch had not really been that considered. Even though um, Henry ruled as an Ottonian, we've seen that family ties didn't really mean much, as even Otto's son rebelled, and so there was always an antagonism between Saxony and Bavaria um, in, in that period b because of this. Um, eventually, the Magyars retreated behind the Leitha and Morava rivers as broader historical border. This brought to a further Germanization of the land. So we're talking about Lower Austria, Istria and Carniola that had remained you know, importantly uh, affected by instability also bec because in fact th the frontier had not been quite defined, right? The Magyars were still to effectively settle down to to sedentarize the the Germans were hoping in fact to strike back to recover those lands. And the quarrels between the Saxon and the Bavarian Ottonians continued under Otto II, who as an emperor deposed his rebellious cousin Duke Henry II of, of Bavaria in 976. This was the son of Henry I and Otto II of course of Otto I. Um, and um, Otto established, at that point, the Duchy of Carinthia on former Bavarian territory um, granted to the former Lutpolding Count Palatine Henry III, who kind of re-entered the political scene uh, in, that, in that way. Uh, in fact, Henry became also Margrave of Verona at the same time. So actually achieving a massive power and factually splitting what was pertaining to the to, to Bavaria uh, in two uh, and the Alps being the the divide factually so that that made sense and just think how difficult it was just to to reclaim eventually that half back right nobody you know both of the Alps didn't have the power to so m most of most of these repartitions were namely as under the Ottonian Empire, also the same empire, right? They was, you know, as long as the local nobility supported these mechanisms, could be done. Otherwise, the means to effectively storm all these areas, the strongest wood, was factually um, unfeasible, right? And albeit Henry II reconciled with Emperor Otto's widow, Teofano, that was this kind of infamous Byzantine princess, because yes, it was finally the Roman marriage. Uh, of the Germanic emperors, but she was just, you know, related, as you know, to an usurper, etc. So it was not really much of a, of a victory. And as you know, the Byzantines were quite careful about not giving the the Western emperors any kind of Roman right on, on parchment. Let's put it in this way. And again, even if Henry II regained his duchy, uh, in the process, the power of Bavaria was further diminished by the rise of a power, a very uh, powerful uh, Franconian house, the one of the of Babenberg, who would rule as Margraves of Austria, Osterriki, as it was known at the time, Österreich, um, in vernacular, who became increasingly independent. And the Babenberg, in fact, in high medieval times, represented one of the single most powerful European lineages who established in Austria uh, a great uh, 
personal state, right? That would, in fact, be aimed at as the the dynasty would extinguish biologically by literally everybody, right? By by the Bohemians, even by Frederick II, uh, and contributed to confine the Bavarian power to to the one that also geographically we see today. So sep bringing to that s separation between Austria and Bavaria that um, there was really the same thing. I mean, the, the broader Bavarian family of, uh, linguistically speaking, is of course encompassing this whole area, right? Also of Austria, of Tyrol, of Styria, Carinthia, etc. It was kind of the, the entire branch, but it would subdivide further during medieval times also because of this political divide. The last Ottonian duke, Henry II's son, Henry III, would become finally Holy Roman Emperor. Um, as the the line of uh, of Saxony extinguished with, with Otto III, and he kind of pursued more or less the same Ottonian policy at that point, albeit the capacity of reviving properly the, the empire on a large scale was was difficult. You know, the Ottonians had managed in this exploit effectively reconnecting the kingdom of Germany with the kingdom of Italy that would remain what we call, in fact, as the Holy Roman Empire. Um, but this was the moment of the rise, in fact, of feudal powers we see in the Babenberg, also the communes in Italy. So the idea of a universal rule was kind of fading, also because the kingdom of Germany was not united uh, by any stretch of the imagination, and further fragmentation was an issue. So um, kind of this regional powers more or less enucleated themselves in, in, in the guys that we we recognize on a map during during the rest of the Middle Ages. Um, the Duchy of Bavaria was ruled um, by the German kings in personal union, dependent dukes, or even emperor's sons, depending on on the political situation. So the Duchy remained central in a sense in the uh, political institutional balance of Germany. The Salians, that was the, that were the the next imperial dynasty after the Ottonians, kind of maintained this uh, interest in Bavaria that, as we've seen, was crucial politically, strategically, um, to consolidate power in Germany and and to secure also the Alpine passes, uh, etc. These times are also the ones in, in which many important aristocratic families, such as the Counts of Andax and the same House of Wittelsbach, emerged. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the spread of feudalism. In Germany, it was taking really a longer time, but all these private lords were securing important uh, power. And Germany, as you, know, as you know, was kind of beginning to expand gradually also toward it's a continuing to expand toward the east and so new opportunities these areas also close to Bavaria or even within itself were were emerging in 1061 the Dowager Empress Agnes of Poitou and felt the Saxon Count Otto of Nordheim in Bavaria as well nevertheless her son King Henry IV again seized the Duchy of Bavaria in kind of a um, tricky way, which triggered, in fact, the Saxon Rebellion of 1073 uh, that uh, also involved Bavaria in part. Henry IV at that point entrusted the Bavarian Duchy to Welf, who was a scion of, a, uh, of the Veronese Margraviel House of Este and progenitor of the Welf dynasty which in fact would rule over Bavaria f intermittently for more than one century to come. And this aspect is interesting because essentially the the House of Este was, um, um, uh, say these were all Germanic uh, noblemen in origin that had been provided with the rule of, of Lombardy and had created this other, you know, thieves personally. So it was just called out from, from this northern Italian areas and becoming effectively the, you know, the head of one of the most powerful dynasties, as you know, in in the in the empire, as the Welfen would be the the major 
opponents to the to the Hohenstaufen later on and creating in fact this massive feudal uh, state that encompassed Bavaria and Saxony at that point against fundamentally what was the this this Wabian power uh, plus the Franconian one at that point kind of cited as the Franconians essentially brought the Swabians to power, the Hohenstaufen, as they had been faithful to Henry IV later on. And so Saxony instead kind of began to to to, to drive away from that axis with Franconia that had historically maintained uh, in Ottonian times. And it's only with the establishment of the Guelph rule as dukes from 1070 by Henry IV that there was a reemergence of the Bavarian ducal power itself that was importantly fueled uh, paradoxically by um, the same crisis that had brought the Welfen to power because this was the period of the investiture controversy where Germany was in turmoil essentially because of this communication of the emperor and so all the various noblemen would find that a, a good excuse to, to rebel uh, to the emperor that in fact was at some point left alone and just the the modest Hohenstaufen managing to win uh, the, the imperial marriage uh, on that occasion arising themselves to power and this this uh, condition of instability favored not didn't favor the kingdom of Germany as a well, whole also because essentially the the investor controversy would have been effectively lost at, le at least by the emperors at least in terms of securing universal control over the episcopal investitures uh, both in Italy and in Germany and the, um, the, uh, the this brought to a further privatization of uh, German establishment uh, at the erosion of public authority that had never been a big deal there so s suffered this significant blow well, the Guelphs were some the major uh, beneficiaries of this. Um, this naturally entailed also a connection with the Pope, because that that those were the uh, the Guelphs were essentially the leverage that the Pope would use um, against Franconian and uh, Swabian power. These Swabians, especially through the control of, over Franconia and definitely the presence on the Bavarian western borders, had the capacity of putting pressure on the Bavarian dukes, uh, also they supported the Babenbergs as you can imagine to attack uh, the, the Bavarians also from, from, the, from the east. Um, but at the same time uh, this, this attrition would, wouldn't benefit neither, would benefit any of the sides. And as you know with the election of Frederick Barbarossa who was both of, in fact, he was an Hohenstaufen, but was uh, a, a, um, also a Belfin from, from his mother, brought to this idea that the, what was becoming now, not much the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, properly the Kingdom of Germany, had to be recompacted also for enacting this major, as you know, universal Mediterranean policy that the Emperor himself embarked in. And so Barbarossa's election was a seen as a reconciliation in Germany that was sanctioned also with the essentially the formal alliance of the Hohenstaufen with the Welfen that was showed uh, you know in good faith initially with the uh, r r giving back to the Bavarian dukes of the Marca Orientalis so technically the eastern land that up to this point had uh, you know been severed from the original Bavaria to, to undermine the same um, at this point Henry the Lion was Duke of Bavaria and also you know ruling on Saxony so mm, this was uh, like uh, the word uh, it was an axis in Germany right between the Franconian Swabians and the Saxon Bavarians that however had kind of also a conflict going on at the same time and the Marca Orientalis um, especially was connected to the Babenberg as we've seen 
and this was a powerful move right um henry the lion took the chance at that point to found numerous cities in bavaria including munich in 1158 that would have become effectively the center of the land with, with, with time and at this point of course the the difficulties emerged when Barbarossa asked as you know this important military contribution for his Italian campaigns against the Lombard League and Henry effectively um, kind of didn't formally refuse per se but you know was literally prayed kneeling by by his cousin to send troops this this was quite heavy the uh, uh, some say that the Battle of Legnano was lost by the Germans effectively because Henry the Lion didn't send his own Saxon troops. In any case, the the break between the two cousins occurred because what was going on in the Rhineland in the northwest, mostly for reasons that didn't really have much to do with the competition between the two sides in itself, but because of you know the imperial prerogative that had to be shown in protecting the, the Episcopal Lordships of the North, which Henry Lyon was expanding against. So that was a bit like a couldn't be touched institutionally. And this brought, as you know, to the exile of Henry the Lyon and the confiscation of his goods. So Henry Lyon was a big deal of a man, right? He founded you know, important cities also in the North. He was married with, into the, the, the English royalty. He had all this mostly, in fact, Northern theater be organized economically in trade etc in any case at that point Barbarossa crushed you know, Henry's power and this led to the separation of Styria as a private duchy uh, in 1180 and thus what was the the older unity of Bavaria was fundamentally lost forever uh, in the process in fact, if one looks at the Wittelsbach rule on Bavaria, it doesn't see moments of enormous power as they had been achieved, for example, under Henry the Lion. It was a big, the peak of also of the medieval civilization in many ways, and uh, the second half of the 12th century was the, 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 the moment in which the, the Germanic Empire was the, the largest power in Western Europe. So it was really moment of a moment of high um you know of high expectations for for german rulers as a whole uh the wittelsbachs began as we've seen pretty you know as any other uh, aristocrats rising from from the bottom and making it to an important uh level um the wittelsbachs were uh Count Palatines, and under Otto the Sixth, they became Dukes of Bavaria. This happened, in fact, in the same 1180. The Wittelsbach treasury at that point was rather poor, right? But the family was very shrewd to put together a significant amount of wealth through purchase, marriage, inheritance, and concentrating power. Um, in in the area, um, they they also pioneered those administrative means that would use uh, mostly the ministeriales as um, local uh, fief holders, so that they wouldn't have to entrust it to to free noblemen that could simply uh, claim eventually those possessions as some degree of of uh, privacy. And uh, the use of the ministeriales, as you know, in in southern Germany, especially, was very strong. It was con counted that it was accounted amounted to ninety percent of the entire German knighthood at the time. Well, it was quite clever. I mean, it was used by the Swabians. At the same time, it was used by the Babenberg. At the same time, so the Wittelsbachs did. Um, there were also the Counts of Andex that were still powerful at this point. Otto's son Ludwig the First was in fifth in 1214 with the county palatine of the Rhine. In fact, at this point, uh, the German political map was dramatically fragmenting, and the kind of the rationale on a, in terms of territorial contiguity 
escapes any any logic because the latter was connected to in fact other other dynamics that were ever more uh, corresponding to in fact the, the collapse of the uh, of the attempts at least to create a national monarchy with the decline of the Hohenstaufen but again this was a moment of great profit for for the other families that could in a sense usurp public rights and um, expand their own private power dramatically as after all the same which was the same policy that the same uh, the same emperors were per pursuing at the time um, uh, hoping especially to secure uh, a control over southern germany in fact that was a bit the, ma the 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 light motive that as we've seen even frederick the second was trying to pursue like to consolidate a, a private possession across swabia and bavaria to and and austria now that they were factually separated to properly control the alpine passes to italy and the, the kingdom of sicily um there was an increased interest properly towards the babenberg uh, estates that were enormous very well administered and when the the line died out the land as you know was taken by by the bohemians eventually it, wa it was the Habsburgs that managed to to defeat uh, Ottokar II and to settle permanently in in Austria, securing at least that power by the end of the 13th century. And the Wittelsbachs, as you understand, were just in the middle, right? So they were trying to to survive and were generally opposed to anybody who would kind of try to spin their movement. In the case of the Habsburgs, that was particularly evident, given that they were Swabians that were settled in Austria, so they were just like from both sides and, and the Wittelsbachs legitimately freaked out and had kind of opposed them for for a long time. Um, in, but the Wittelsbachs, as, as we've seen, were kind of enlightened for those times, given, for example, they didn't have a preference for succession of the firstborn, right? That That's something that had taken a long time to be bypassed and actually at the time was still kind of normal but in this feudal intricacy such families realized it was better to to act rationally rather than just by this preconditioned uh, method and um, this helped concentration of power in spite of this in 1255 there was um, a division of the land into upper Bavaria with the Palatinate and the Nordgau uh, with the center in Munich and lower Bavaria with the seats in Landshut and Burghausen and this is still existing in, in Bavaria fundamentally and Bavaria gained uh, an important moment in the international scene at the time of Louis IV Ludwig the Bavarian, in fact, we made uh, some video about him and uh, his um, attempt, in fact, to restore also an imperial rule in Italy, or better, the very shrewd move that he made to secure the, the imperial crowning and kind of blackmailing the Bavarian Italian city states to, to, to cash, you know, for, for, for paying his own, his own expedition in the peninsula, is a, an excellent sovereign as you know he was firstly opposed to, to the papacy was excommunicated he was a protector of great um, anti-universalists made a video exactly about that such as Marcellus of Padua and uh, William of Ockham and uh, he made Munich also a real European capital he improved he was a, a very good administrator improved especially trade uh, the economical side also the art um, and he he was effectively also the first Wittelsbach emperor in 1328. It was a big deal. Um, the, the Wittelsbachs by that point had become, together with the Habsburgs, the Vedivet and the, the Hohenzollern, the, um, the, among the most, and the Luxembourgs, especially uh, against which they would in fact uh, contend the, the imperial crowning uh, for especially that specific time uh, one of the most powerful lineages in Germany and in Europe and by very complicated dynastic ties that now we, we don't have to uh, 
um, and political negotiation and wars, as you understand. Um, to to digress on, the Wittelsbachs managed to gain important areas such as Brandenburg entirely in 1323. Of course, they were ruled in a proxy fashion, as all feudal things uh, decentralized, but still was a big deal. Um, here, the game properly of um, uh, let's say of trying to to marry to the most powerful dynasties uh, to secure kind of a higher feudal power it was properly royal policy and was very frequent especially in central Europe where centralization was so complicated because of the absence of a of a, of a real of a real state public authority uh, the same is uh, goes for Tyrol in 1342, and even faraway places in the northwest, such as Holland, Zeeland, and Friesland, also I know in 1345, um, that, however, were lost under Louis IV's successors. Also, the, the lands of Tyrol were lost to the Habsburgs with the Treaty of Scherding in 1369, especially those lands were kind of really something on their own. There, there, was, there was an incredibly complicated policy behind those. And again, the, the level of instability, just, just if, if anything, not, not even about politics or, or, or the military things, but, you know, simply the biological stuff. I mean, people dying without hairs, you know. These things um, made it very difficult for Bavaria to, to extend its power to consolidate further. Like, a, uh, now I, I will reconquer Tyrol. It was basically impossible. They would do this kind of things just by, in fact, this kind of dynastic ties by purchase and so on. Because at the end of the day, it was these communities were already established within their own boundaries. They wouldn't, they wouldn't like anybody to to come with iron fist to rule them. So it was a very delicate situation. This is the same time. I don't know. The Habsburgs are losing Switzerland, their their homelands. Um, to the to the Swiss Confederates that are rebelling simply from within their own lands, and you know they prefer Austria at that point. It was much larger state. Um, this is also the crisis of medieval Europe, the plague, uh, demographic and, ec and economic contraction, the refeudalization that, in this sense, at least favored the the elitization of these families that kind of enucleated them as the main, most some of the most important ones over over the others in the in the hierarchy. Um, also, the Dutch counties were lost to Burgundy in 1436. Later on, in 1329, with the Treaty of Pavia, uh, Louis the uh, Louis de, de Bavarian, Ludwig de Bavarian divided ownership uh, in a Palatine region with the Rhine Palatinate and later so-called Upper Palatinate. As a consequence, the electoral dignity for the line was passed onwards to to the Palatinate. And with the recognition of the limits of domination by the Bavarian Duke uh, in 1275, also Salzburg uh, essentially began to drive away from from ducal power because the local archbishop began to administer himself um, in uh, 1328, and so factually gaining an independent status within the Holy Roman Empire would be institutionally san sanctioned. Right? So, again, this was even at a closer land, and there wasn't much that, that the Bavarian dukes could do to prevent its autonomization. And the worst, however, came later in the second half of the 14th and in the 15th century, because at this point the same Bavaria subdivided itself repeatedly. There were four areas, right, uh, that uh, were kind of all mixed, but possessions scattered everywhere, but kind of gravitated around the most important cities. So these four lines corresponded effectively, in fact, to the areas of Bavaria revolving around Straubing, Landshut, Ingolstadt, and Munich. And they were, it's as if there were four duchies at the same time. And in fact, these uh, noblemen waged war against each other regularly. Uh, Duke Albrecht IV of Bavaria Munich uh, managed to reunite Bavaria at the beginning of the sec 6th century through uh, a hell of a war of, of, uh, of succession 
and uh, reaffirming the rights of primogeniture, so uh, giving effectively to Bavaria the, that important status that it would maintain also during the, the modern age in Germany and you know being a considerable power for, for times and places. Um, however, other important uh, possessions such as Kufstein, Kitzbühel and Rattenberg in Tyrol were lost in the same in the same period. So could go on with, with modern history, but more or less this is the history of Bavaria. We will keep talking about the Dutch of Bavaria and um, other German historical regions. For today, however, we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.